I'm going to ask you to think about a problem up front that you're not yet equipped to deal with. Some of you have probably had a course that would equip, equip you to deal with this problem, so I'm not talking about you. If you've never studied problems like this, probably this uh, one will seem a bit mysterious to you, but let me describe it to you and ask you to try to answer it as best you can in a few seconds, just from whatever uh, mental resources that you might choose to bring to bear on it. In this situation, the waiter is trying to decide whether to give good service. It's more effortful to give good service. Uh, uh, if he gives sloppy service, uh, it's easier. If he gives bad service, though, he won't get a tip. So his payoff is lower. It's only 80 than if he gives good service and he gets a tip. In that case, he gets 100. The, the complication is th that is if he gives good service, the diner has then the option to, to decide whether or not to leave a tip. If he doesn't leave a tip, the waiter gets a low payoff. The waiter gets that higher payoff only if the diner decides to hold up his end of the bargain. Rod? Can you turn the volume down? Does that help? Yep. Yep. Sorry about that. So the question, what's the question? Uh, what's going to happen here? That, uh, you have to uh, think about that question in order to answer the question that I'm asking, which is how much would the diner be willing to pay maximum for the right to make a visible binding commitment to leave a tip if he gets good service? So imagine there's some contract he could sign in full view of the, of the waiter the waiter would know uh, that if the diner signed that contract, uh, the waiter would be sure to get a tip if he gave good service. So maybe Arthur Anderson has an employee that would be watching and, and make an independent judgment about whether the waiter gave good service. Uh, and if he did, and then uh, the, the diner didn't leave a tip as a result of that, the, the firm would levy a big penalty on the, on the diner, uh, so he wouldn't have any incentive to not leave a tip. Uh, so, if I could sign that contract, if I'm the diner, what's the most it would be worth to me to be able to make that kind of a visible commitment, visible to the waiter, to, to leave a tip in the event I got good service? Is it $30? Is it $100? Is it $170? Is it $200? Is it none of the above? <laughs> I see a couple of blank expressions. Uh, no, I don't want to discuss what to do or anything like that. If, is it not clear what the question? I just had a question about the diagram. Are those numbers just like overall benefits? Yeah, yeah, payoffs. Okay. In, maybe they're in drachmas, uh, uh, rupees, pesos. Doesn't matter. They're comparable is, is, the, is the issue. They're, they're, it's, it's a fungible currency of payoff. OK, Try, yeah, if, you, if, if that was a problem on quiz two, which it might well be, what would you do? Take your one in five chance to circle one of them? Uh, or could you get closer than that? I'll come back. Uh, to this. I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, for you to think about this and then uh, give me feedback if you have any uh, about whether thinking about it made it easier to grasp what I was talking about when I get around to talking about problems like this. Uh, maybe you won't know. Maybe, maybe uh, you'll react to that discussion uh, uh, as, you, as you would and you won't know whether you would have reacted differently because you thought about this problem, uh, or, or if you hadn't thought about it, would the, would the way you absorb the information have been different? You may not know, but if you have a feeling about whether it had an effect, let me know. I'm curious to know whether it's useful to take time asking you to think about questions like this at the beginning of the hour. The New York Times Magazine piece I asked you to read suggested that it was useful to do that. That sounds right to me, but I don't have any hard evidence of my own that it's right, and so I'm, I'm curious. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the most famous game of all. Uh, probably you've heard of it before. How many of you learned about the prisoner's dilemma as undergraduates? Okay, not everybody. If you didn't, uh, you might want to uh, consider the possibility of not giving a nickel ever to your undergraduate institution. They're guilty of profound educational malpractice. Uh, if they didn't design a curriculum that would have you knowing about the prisoner's dilemma by the time you graduated. It's an extremely important concept. You can't understand what's going on in the world if you don't know about this concept. Uh, I'm glad a lot of you learned about it, but d dismayed that there were as many of you as didn't raise hands in response to my question. Uh, so pay careful attention to this uh, description of the most famous game in the world because it's famous for a reason. It characterizes countless situations that you will encounter each and every day in the real world. If you don't understand this, uh, this game, then you, you won't know what's going on out there. You'll be severely handicapped in your efforts to make sense of what's happening. So here's the narrative that was used to describe it. Two prisoners, X and Y, are uh, in separate cells. They, they are guilty of a serious crime, but the DA doesn't have evidence sufficient to convict them of it. He can convict them only of a minor offense for which the penalty is just a year in jail. Uh, they did it. He knows they did it, but he can't prove it, but he can prove this minor offense. He tells each of them the following. If one of you confesses and the other remains silent, the confessor will go scot-free, no time in jail at all. The other one, 20 years in the slammer. If you both confess, you'll get an intermediate sentence, five years. Not attractive, but better than 20 years. If neither one of you confesses, uh, he can't convict you of anything but the minor offense, you get one year. Okay. We can summarize the three elements in this or any other game uh, as the players, here the two prisoners, the strategies available to them, here confess or remain silent, those are the only choices open to them that we care about. Uh, payoffs are in terms of resulting jail sentences, sentences that correspond to combinations of strategy choices. Here is what we call the payoff matrix for this game. Prisoner Y chooses confess or remain silent. Prisoner X chooses confess or remain silent. If we know the two choices, then we know which of the four cells we're in. If Prisoner Y says remain silent and Prisoner X says confess, we know we're here. That's how it works. In this game, both players uh, have a reason to prefer being here than being here. Does anyone disagree with that? Would you rather spend five years in jail than one? No, this is an uncontroversial claim. You'd rather get the short sentence than the longer one. That's what these prisoners are assumed to care about is only their own narrow interest. I don't want to spend any more time in jail than necessary. I'm not concerned about doing the right thing. I'm not concerned about being faithful to any deities. I'm not concerned about anything else other than these payoffs. It's a simplifying assumption. Is that the way people are? Maybe not. But that's the way the, the game is analyzed in this first pass edit. Yes. No, no, I'm not assuming that at all. I'm assuming all they care about is these payoffs. If you add that, then you're saying they care about something besides these payoffs, being loyal to the other. Might it pay them to care about that? That's, another, that's an interesting question, and it's one we'll, t we'll take up. But, but no, in this pass, they don't care about anything other than the payoffs. If, if they cared about loyalty, we could build that in. We could... Uh, we could add in uh, a, a negative uh, additional uh, 
pay off if you if you ratted on your opponent then you get another you get a guilty conscience and so that's a, a that makes that pay pay off even worse than five years in jail but there's nothing else but these payoffs in this first pass of the game they would rather have uh, five one year in jail than five but they're going to end up spending five years in jail. Why? Because each has what's called a dominant strategy. That's a vocabulary word. Make a note of that. What's a dominant strategy? It's a strategy choice that when each player uh, chooses it, it, when a player chooses it, he gets a better outcome no matter what the other guy does. That's what it means to be a dominant strategy. I choose a strategy, if I do better with that choice, no matter what the other guy does, then that strategy is said to be a dominant strategy. Each player has a dominant strategy. What is it? It's to confess. Think about the problem here from the perspective of prisoner X. He doesn't know what Y is going to do, let's assume, at the outset. And so he says, well, let me play it out under alternative assumptions about what Y does. Suppose Y confesses. If I suppose that, then I know if I'm prisoner X, I'm in the left-hand column. All I can do is choose between this cell and that cell if he has chosen confess. I can't go anywhere else. Those are the only two places I can go. If I confess, I get five years. If I remain silent, I get 20 years. What's better for me? Confess is a better strategy. That's if he confesses. If he remains silent, let me play it out in that scenario. If I confess, I get zero years in jail. I like that. If I remain silent, I get one year in jail. Not so bad, but way worse than not spending any time in jail at all. It's better to confess in both cases than to remain silent. And so that's the assumption that uh, governs the, the analysis of the game in standard game theory, that's what he'll do. It's a dominant strategy, he'll do that. It's a dominant strategy, all, tra <clears throat> strategy also for why to confess. Think about the symmetry of the game. You don't even have to review the options, but let's review them for practice. Y doesn't know what X will do. So he says, suppose X confesses. If I confess, I get five years. If I remain silent, I get 20. What's better for me? Confess. Suppose X remains silent. If I confess, I get zero years. If I remain silent, I get one year. Again, better to confess than to remain silent. They both confess, and they get five years each. They could have gotten one year each if they'd remained silent. What, are they stupid? No, that's the point is not that they're stupid. The point is that self-interested behavior leads to a bad outcome in situations like this one. This situation is a flat contradiction of the naive faith in the invisible hand, you might say. Uh, the invisible hand uh, enthusiasts say, turn people loose, let them do what they want, and we'll get the best possible outcome for society as a whole. Often you do get good outcomes for society when you turn people loose and say, do what's best for you. You get cost-saving innovations. You get uh, 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 price competition that benefits consumers. You get all sorts of good things that happen, but not always. There are situations like this one where what's good for the individual is not good for everybody. Here is a, a, a very striking contrast between the interests of individuals on the one hand and groups on the other. Think about the, the incentives confronting people uh, who, who want to watch hockey games at Cornell. They put tickets on sale uh, on Tuesday morning at 8 p.m. Uh, or 8 a.m. rather. Uh, what do you do? Well, they don't have enough tickets on offer to satisfy everybody who wants them. Uh, economists say, well, you ought to charge more. Uh, but they don't do that. So what do they, what do, they do historically? They said, uh, first come, first served. And so people would line up uh, not a few minutes before 8, because if you lined up a few minutes before 8, you'd be way at the back of the line. You wouldn't get any tickets. They came Saturday afternoon to line up. Uh, and they camped out for a couple of days uh, uh, in order to 
ensure that they would get tickets that they wanted that wouldn't otherwise be available to them. But it's a prisoner's dilemma if you think about the incentives they faced. Uh, so there are the long lines. Let's put some n numbers on the incentives they face and, and show formally why that's a multi-person prisoner's dilemma. So I'm going to assume everybody shows up an hour in advance. You've got a 50-50 chance to get a ticket. You, know, you might be first in line. You might be last in line. If they all show up an hour in advance, it's, it's just a random pick. The half who don't get tickets might include you. It might not. If you show up 24 hours in advance and everybody else shows up one hour in advance, you're going to get a ticket for sure. If you all show up 24 hours in advance, you got a 50-50 chance again in that case, too. It's, it's relative time of arrival that matters, not absolute time of arrival. OK. So if it's all symmetric, the same incentives apply to you as to other uh, students. Let's make some incentives about the relevant costs and benefits. You'd be willing to pay $40 to avoid waiting overnight in line. That's what you would have to do if you came 24 hours early and uh, you don't like doing that, you'd pay $40 to avoid it. Getting a 50-50 chance at a ticket, uh, uh, a ticket uh, is worth 100 if you're going to get it for, for sure, but uh, only half a chance of getting it, it's worth 50 to you by assumption here. And other students also assign the same values uh, to those outcomes as you do. What's going to happen here? Well, we can make... Uh, uh, a, a payoff matrix. Let's think about calculating the relevant magnitudes to go in each cell. If you and others come way early, you got a 50% chance to get a ticket. Ticket's worth 100 to you. You're going to pay a $40 waiting cost from being in line for the whole night. Your payoff is 10. We can, uh, in that same fashion, generate each of the entries in this payoff ma matrix. So if if you come 24 hours early, and others come only an hour early, you're going to get a ticket for sure. That's worth 100 to you. But you wait for 24 hours, that costs you 40. That's why you get 60 in the cell. Others aren't going to get a ticket, so they get nothing. They don't have to wait, so they don't incur that cost, but they get nothing. Symmetry means same payoffs in reverse here. Down here, everybody comes one hour early, no waiting cost. Everybody has a 50-50 chance at a ticket, 50 each. Okay. That's a prisoner's dilemma. Look at the incentives that each uh, of the players, you on the one hand, others on the other hand, face. There's a dominant strategy here, and it's to arrive 24 hours early. Look at it from your perspective. You don't know what they're going to do. Suppose they all come early. If you come early, too, you get a payoff of 10. If you come just before the ticket window opens, you get zero. Better to come early. If they come uh, at the last minute and you come early, you get 60. If you come at the last minute too, you get 50. Better for you each time to come early. Better for them each time to come early. Dominant strategies uh, on both sides, they play them, and the outcome is everybody comes 24 hours early. Everybody wastes 24 hours waiting in line. It could have been resolved more efficiently than that if they'd all come an hour ahead of time. But it's not going to do any good to say, look, this is inefficient, guys. Come an hour early. Because if there's no binding agreement, uh, way to make an agreement to do that, people are going to come early just to be sure they're going to get one uh, and not miss their chance. You need some other mechanism to solve this. Here's an economic naturalist question, uh, same domain. Why is it that hockey players left to their own devices skate without helmets? Every single time uh, we've had a chance to see what happens, that's what happens. They don't wear helmets. But then we notice that if we give them a chance to vote secretly in a ballot, uh, they almost unanimously, in every case, vote for a rule requiring themselves to wear helmets. So one economist asked, if helmets are so great, guys, why don't you just wear them? Why do you need a rule? And he thought about that, and he had 
a pretty compelling answer to the question. It's an in interesting sounding question at first, but the answer is so simple that to me, it doesn't feel like an interesting question anymore. But I've been doing these for a long time. I hope you'll think it's an interesting answer to the question the first time you hear it. It's based on some plausible assumptions. We've got two teams, and they care about things in the way that we know people generally tend to care about things. They, they know that not wearing a helmet uh, makes them more likely to win their contest. Why? Because if you don't wear one, you can see a little better and hear a little better. Maybe there's a psychological dimension, too. If you're nuts enough to skate without a helmet, I better give you a, a, a little bit wider berth uh, as you skate toward the goal. I'm not going to tangle with you. Uh, who knows what you'll do to me if you're crazy enough to skate without a helmet. So they get an edge. Do athletes care about getting an edge? If you've ever been in a competitive sport, you know that uh, there's almost nothing else that matters uh, than getting an edge. Do they care about their safety? Yes, they care about that too. They know that taking off their helmet means they're more likely to get injured. People got injured. They got grievously injured when they skated without helmets. Goalies didn't wear helmets uh, for much of the history of the, of the hockey competitions. Uh, they didn't because they were uh, an impediment to seeing the puck. Uh, you, couldn't, you weren't as likely to break. But that meant you didn't have any teeth after you played for a season or two. You took so many pucks in the face. Uh, it, was, it was risky. They knew it was risky, but getting an edge was important. But why take the risk, all of us, when everybody taking off his helmet makes everybody more likely to win, and hence it makes nobody more likely to win. It levels the playing field. If we set up the, the way the individual rankings steer the payoffs in this game, though, we get this matrix. If everybody wears a helmet, the players like that outcome better than they like that outcome. That's uncontestable. If you don't wear a helmet, you're the Bruins, uh, and they do wear a helmet, that's the best outcome. You're a little less safe, but you're going to win. You got an edge. It's the worst outcome for them for the same reason. If those are the rankings of the outcomes, then what we have here is a prisoner's dilemma. It's straightforwardly a prisoner's dilemma. What's the dominant strategy? Don't wear a helmet. If the Bruins are wondering what to do, they say, what if the Rangers wear a helmet? If we don't wear one, that's the best outcome we could get. What's the other choice we could make if we're the Bruins? Well, we could wear one, then we'll get the second best outcome. Best is better than second best. If they wear a helmet, we don't wear one. What if they don't wear a helmet? If we wear one, we get the worst outcome. We get only the third worst outcome if we don't wear a helmet. It's better for us not to wear one. It's better for them not to wear one. It's a dominant strategy for each side. They do it, and they end up in a bad situation. That's the way the prisoner's dilemma is. Here. And, and so, so we, we had a rule to wear helmets. And some players uh, who were grandfathered didn't wear helmets. And that illustrates what? It, well, maybe I just, you know, why, why would they have chosen not to wear a helmet? To gain advantage? Yeah, I kind of guess, but it seems like that. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you could say uh, if there were more grandfathered players on our side than their side, then it would be rational uh, for them to take advantage of that loophole and not wear helmets because they'd get an edge that they liked. Uh, and the other side wouldn't be able to match that edge. But, but yeah, in the long run, this rule uh, ended up applying to everyone. Uh, and, and I think the, the players, for the most part, are glad as, uh, that, that they have that rule. Suppose somebody were to object a hockey player like the one Harry described, that rule robs me of my freedom to decide for myself whether to wear a helmet. 
Is that an accurate statement? Yes. The rule does rob you of your freedom to decide for yourself whether to wear a helmet. That's the whole point of the rule. If you have the freedom to decide for yourself whether to wear a helmet, you won't wear one because competitive pressure will force you not to wear one, in effect. If you don't like that outcome, the only way you can escape the consequences of it is to adopt a rule whereby you volunteer to give up your freedom to skate without a helmet. So think about what the real issue of freedom is at stake in situations like this. People will say that the helmet rule, oh, that's the tyranny of the majority. The libertarians will come out of the woodwork and they'll say, oh, that's a violation of individual freedom. Well, yes, it is. But it wasn't an ill-considered violation of individual freedom. If you stop at a stoplight, that's a violation of individual freedom. What do you mean? Why I want to go where I want to go, when I want to go there. You're telling me I can't go where I want? Yes, we're telling you that. In some cases, violating your right to choose for yourself is something that's not only good for others, it's good for you too. So don't be misled by silly slogans in debate over government regulations. Oh, that violates people's freedoms. Yeah, okay. It may be that that's the only way you can get where you want to get to, is to voluntarily sign up to waive some of your freedoms. If you said you can't make rules, that would be the tyranny of the individual. If you call rules the tyranny of the majority, that's wrong. In general, it's not, it may, may be uh, a correct criticism in some instances, but People think that the debate is over if they, if they point out that what you want to do restricts somebody's freedom. Uh, lots of things that we want to do restrict our own freedom. And we, we choose to do them with our eyes open, fully cognizant of the fact that they're going to restrict our freedom. We want to restrict our freedom because we know if we don't do that, we'll get a worse outcome. That's what happens in the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoners wish they could restrict their freedom to confess. What if they could take a pill that would make it impossible to confess? They'd be giving up their freedom, but that's exactly what they would want to do if they could do that. Once you see the prisoner's dilemma in different contexts, you'll realize it's everywhere. There's just not a place you can go where you don't see examples, vivid, powerful examples of the prisoner's dilemma. There are duels uh, that used to be fought when somebody would offend uh, another gentleman's honor. It would be part of the code that you challenge that person to a duel. Everybody now knows that Hamilton got shot by Aaron Burr. Uh, I couldn't use that example a few years ago. No, but who? Uh, pe people wouldn't even know who the, the players were in the example. Now everybody knows they had a duel. And Hamilton, a great, a great uh, founding father of the country, is dead because they had a duel. Uh, Why did they have a duel? Because that was how gentlemen defended their honor once upon a time. But the duels weren't free-for-alls. They had rules. And the rules are instructive about the nature of the incentives we're trying to create in, in different kinds of situations. You can't come to the duel with an army. You can't come with 10 tanks uh, lined up behind you. There are certain rules that you have to satisfy. Look at the rules uh, that people adopted when duels were permitted. There were only certain kinds of pistols you could use. There were certain kinds of procedures that you had to follow. So the, the distance between you and your rival at the moment you were permitted to fire your weapons was not zero. You had to line up back to back and then march off a, a given number of paces and then turn and fire. That was one rule. Another rule was that you uh, had to have a gun that uh, had a barrel that was smooth on the inside. It couldn't, it couldn't have uh, spiral grooves engraved into it. Uh, another rule said that your gun could fire only a single bullet. 
Uh, those, those were detailed rules. There were people who came to help enforce the rules. What were they having rules for? Why weren't people free to do whatever they wanted to do? Because it would have been a prisoner's dilemma if they didn't have w rules. So why not, why not just turn and fire? Uh, stand back to back and at the count of three, turn and fire. If, you, if, that, if that's what you're allowed to do, both duelists get killed. They didn't want that. They wanted you to uh, accept some risk to defend your honor. That was the code. They didn't want you to get killed for sure defending your honor. Uh, march 20 paces and then turn and fire. Uh, you might miss if, if you're that far away. Only a single shot pistol, that's all you're allowed to bring. Uh, what's the purpose of that rule? What if they let you bring <laughs> multi-shot weapons? Uh, you're both going to go down dead if you have uh, AK-47s uh, as your weapons in the duel. It doesn't work. Uh, they wanted you to have a chance in the duel. They didn't want you to die for sure. What about the barrel scoring, the engraving uh, of the spiral grooves? Why did they outlaw that? as part of their rules about duels. It was because if they had those grooves, the bullet would come out with a spin, and it would go much more tr uh, on a true path toward where it was aimed than if it came out from a smooth-barreled weapon with no spin. It would be like the difference between somebody throwing a football with a tight spiral. That's the, that's the, the manner of pass that gets where it wants to get to in the, in the most reliable way. If you throw a projectile without a spin, like a knuckleball in baseball, who knows where it's going to go? That's the whole point. It goes hither and yon. Uh, and that's what they wanted. They didn't want them to be ac accurate, uh, these weapons. So in these duels, uh, the rules were pretty good. Uh, one in six duelists got hit by a bullet in one sample of British duels. There's a, a, a study made of, of what? One in 14 died only. Hamilton was unlucky. Uh, he, he had a 13 14th chance to make it through. He didn't make it through. So the rules helped, but they, they weren't all that good. Would you like to be permitted to duel uh, somebody who offended you, or, or would you like to feel compelled by an honor code to challenge somebody to a duel if they offended you somehow, maybe even by accident? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If somebody, uh, if I offend somebody, which I manage to do uh, uh, without effort uh, much of the time, <laughs> and people were free to challenge me to a duel, I would feel pretty good about saying, yeah, I'd like to duel you but it's against the law. It's pro prohibited now. If we do that, they'll throw us in jail if we do that now. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell them uh, the reason that we adopted that rule was that it was a prisoner's dilemma. We're going to end up in, the, in, in an outcome uh, with bad, bad uh, results for both of us compared to one we could get if we restricted our ability to duel, and better still, don't even allow duels in the first place. Now, have your guy call my guy. We'll talk, we'll talk it over. Uh, I, I wish I could duel you, but I can't. Uh, it's against the law. I don't really wish I could duel you. I'll say, maybe I'll say that just to appear uh, like a tougher person than I am. But uh, people who think about it don't wish they could duel. They, they, they think it's a good thing not to duel. You're going to live through this prisoner's dilemma day after tomorrow for yet another time if you go to the Sage Social. You'll find that it's hard to hear your conversation partners in the environment that we uh, host the Sage Socials in. It's a very brittle acoustic environment. The situation is familiar to you. If everybody spoke in a very uh, calm, normal tone of voice, you'd be able to hear OK. It wouldn't be easy to hear, but you'd hear OK. But you'd hear better if you spoke a little louder, if you and your conversation uh, partner up the level of, of the volume of your voices just a bit. You, you'd hear one another more easily. It wouldn't be difficult for you uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, to have done that. But that would increase the ambient noise in the room. 
Uh, and so others would have an incentive to up the level at which they spoke, and pretty soon you're in this exact prisoner's dilemma. If you speak normally, that's a better outcome than if you raise your voices. But raising your voices is a dominant strategy when you're in that environment. No matter whether others raise their voices or not, you get a better outcome if you raise your voice. And the equilibrium is one where you get a worse outcome than a, a, an outcome that's totally within reach for people to achieve if they could somehow coordinate on not raising their voices. But individually, no one has an incentive to make that move. It's a prisoner's dilemma. Here's a vocabulary word, Nash equilibrium. Uh, if you haven't seen the film A Beautiful Mind, I think it's on Netflix, uh, get it and watch it. It's about John Nash. He was the father of game theory. He was a Princeton profession, professor. He lost his mind shortly after he did this work. He had a severe breakdown and never really uh, fully recovered. Still. He was granted the Nobel Prize by the Selection Committee to honor him for the incredible importance of the work he did on this topic. And the film is good. Uh, Russell Crowe is John Nash. Doesn't look much like Don John Nash, but, <laughs> but uh, 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 it, it's a film worth watching. You'll learn a little bit of game theory in practical settings by watching it. Uh, is it worth your time to do it? I'm not going to make a judgment on that, but I think it might be worth your time. What's a Nash equilibrium? It's a combination of strategies in a game such that neither player wants to change what he or she did given what the other player did. That sounds complicated. You'll need to practice to be able to apply that definition with facility, so I would urge you to practice. So let's practice. Uh, is there a Nash equilibrium in the prisoner's dilemma? This is the easiest possible question I could ask you about Nash equilibrium. Is there a Nash equilibrium in that hockey helmet example? Yes, is the answer. And where is it? It's this cell here. That's the Nash equilibrium. It's a combination of strategies such that neither player wants to change what he does given what the other player did, okay? So how would you convince a skeptic that that's a Nash, Nash equilibrium? Well, let's say I'm the Rangers and I'm here. Do I want to move? Do I want to move? I see some people shaking yes and some people shaking no. The answer better be no if I'm right that it's a Nash equilibrium. Do I want to move? Somebody says, well, yeah, he wants to move here. Third best is worse than second best. He can't move there. The Rangers are here. Where can they move? They can move to one other cell only. And where would that be? To the worst point, point where you think he can move. Yeah, here. Rangers control the row. They can either wear helmets or not wear helmets. If you're here and you're the Rangers, where can you go? There's only one place you can go, here. Do they want to go there? Third best here, worst here. Do they want to go there? No. So I'm here, I'm the, I'm the Rangers, do I want to move? No. I'm here, I'm the Bruins, do I want to move? No. Where could, where could I move? Point, tell me where I could move. Here, that's the only place I can move. Yeah, you got to know where people can move to answer the question. So if I'm here, do I want to move? No. This is the third best outcome. And if, if I'm the, the Bruins, I move here, it's the worst outcome. That's a Nash equilibrium. You just proved it. If you could answer those questions about why nobody would want to move from the lower right cell. OK? Can you do that? Uh, maybe not yet, but by the time quiz two rolls around, you want to be able to do that. Is this a Nash equilibrium? You want to be able to explain why it is or it isn't. Is this a Nash equilibrium? What do you have to show? 
if you want to say it's not one. You want to show only that there is at least one player who wants to move. If even one player wants to move, it can't be a Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium requires nobody wants to move. So you're the Bruins. You're here. Do you want to move? That's the best outcome for you. If you move, the only place you could move is here. You don't want to move. You're done. You don't need to even ask about whether the Rangers want to move. All you need to show that a cell is not a Nash equilibrium is to show that at least one of the, the players doesn't want to move from it. You're done. You're, you're finished. Games can have a Nash equilibrium, or they, or they might not. Uh, they might have a Nash equilibrium, even though not every player has a dominant strategy. That's not the only uh, uh, set of incentives that leads us to an equilibrium of this sort. <clears throat> Should Americans spend more on advertising? Here's going to be a game where not every player has a dominant strategy. We've got United and American. They're serving a city pair. And the decision is a game. They, they have to decide whether to advertise more or leave their ad spending the same in this city pair market. And here are the relevant payoffs. These are given. Uh, I pulled them out of thin air just to, to illustrate uh, the points I, I want to make with this example. Does United have a dominant strategy? How would you answer that question? Well, you would say, if you were united, I don't know what they're going to do. Let's suppose they raise their ad spending. Well, what should I want to do in that case? If they raise their ad spending, what are my choices if I'm united? United chooses the row. I can either be here. If I'm there, I get 3,000. Or I could be here, I get 4,000. What, what do I want to do? I want to be here. 4,000 is better than 3,000. If they raise their ad spending, I want to leave mine the same. If they leave theirs the same, I'm united. What do I want to do? I get 8,000 if I raise mine. I get 5,000 if I leave it the same. What do I want to do? I want to raise mine. So my best move is not the same no matter what they do. It's not a prisoner's dilemma. I don't even have a, a dominant strategy in this case. You can have games where both firms have a dominant strategy. It's not a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, not all games are of that sort are prisoner's dilemmas. This is all stuff that should be familiar and natural to you by the time uh, 10 more days roll around. Sooner the better, even. What about American? Does it have an, a dominant strategy? It does, it turns out. You're American. What should I do? Well, I don't know what United's going to do. Suppose they raise ad, ad spending. If I'm American, I choose the column. I can't choose the row. If they raise ad spending, do I want to be here or here? Well, 8,000 is better than 4,000. I want to be here if they raise their ad spending. If they leave theirs the same and I raise mine, I want to be here or here. Here's better. 5,000 is better than 2,000. So if, I, if United raises or leaves it the same, doesn't matter which, I want to raise my ad spending if I'm American. Where is this game going to end up? We don't know what United's going to do, do we? Because it doesn't have a, uni a, a uni uh, dominant strategy. What, what do we do in a case like this? United doesn't have a dominant strategy, but it knows something. What does it know? These payoffs are visible. They're on the table. Everybody sees them. What do they know? They know American has a dominant strategy. So I'm united. I'm sitting there trying to figure out what to do. Ah, oh, I don't have a dominant strategy. What was me? I can't figure out what to do. That's not the point to quit. You say, what are they going to do? Well, there are some games where you won't know what they're going to do, and then you'll be in a quandary. But this isn't one of those games. If you say, what are they going to do, you can reason very simply that they have a dominant strategy, which is to raise their ad spending. Then you know exactly what to do. They're, if they're going to do that, you don't want to be here. You want to be here. This is a Nash equilibrium. How would you show that it is? You would ask whether anybody wants to move from this cell to a cell that he could move to. If you're united, you're here. Do you want to move? Where could you move? 
point. Yeah, you don't want to move there because you get a lower payoff. You're American, you're here. Where could you move? Give me an arrow, come on. You're, you're, yeah. Here, you don't want to go there. You're getting 5,000, you don't want to get 2,000. No one wants to move, it's a Nash equilibrium. Is this a Nash equilibrium? No. Why? Because you'll find somebody who doesn't want to move right away if you try. This is easy to do this, but if you don't uh, practice it and pay attention carefully to it, you'll get quiz questions wrong. You want to be an investment banker. You need a good grade in the course. <laughs> and yet, investment bankers get questions like this wrong. Is this a nasty equilibrium? I don't know. Uh, why do you want to be in that position? If, if it matters to you, to do well in the course, learn what it means to be a Nash equilibrium. It's, everybody who got admitted could learn this in his sleep, but, but people don't learn it. How do I know that? Because I've given questions like this, and people seem to be saying, I don't know. Uh, is this a Nash equilibrium? No. And it is a, a Nash equilibrium. It's a definition. You just have to apply it. You know, It's points on the table. All of this is assuming that the two, the two parties are not talking to each other in any way. They just see these outcomes. But right, they don't right, right. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and the world might be different. What if the prisoners could talk to each other and make a binding agreement? You know, uh, if, if I confess, you kill my dog. If you confess, I kill your dog. Uh, or somebody will, not, not me. Uh, the, the, the decision would be different. <clears throat> Here's a game uh, that's going to start edging us closer to being able to think about that example I urge you to think about in the beginning. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to maybe challenge some of the traditional assumptions about how people evaluate alternatives. Uh, let's see. Th this is, incidentally, a, a, a set of issues that were developed uh, in the John... Johnson School by uh, experiments conducted here a couple of decades ago. It's a very prominent area of research now, uh, and colleagues of mine uh, were involved in the development of these ideas. They're important ideas, and, and I urge you to you know, pay careful attention to them because they're important. Here's the basic idea. You've got two players in this game. Uh, it's an experiment. The experimenter gives $100 to Tom. Maybe think of it as $101 bills, crisp uh, from the, the mint. Uh, and Tom then has, has the assignment of proposing a division of the 100 between him and Michael. Any division you want uh, with just these constraints. You, you have to propose that Michael get at least $1. You can't propose to give him nothing or uh, two cents or anything, anything other that's, that's lower than one dollar. The, the, you have to propose an integer amount uh, uh, as well. And so that's the, that's the constraint. And so if, if, for example, Tom proposes x for me, 100 minus x for you, Michael's move is to say whether he accepts the proposal. If he accepts it, they each get the amounts proposed. If he refuses it, here's the twist in this game. If he refuses Tom's offer, each gets zero. Each gets zero. So the assumption is that they're both narrowly self-interested. They're the classical economic men, homo economicus. Uh, they care about their own payoffs and only their own payoffs. And the game's played once and only once. There are no reputational effects to worry about, none of that. It's common knowledge that these things are true. They're just trying to make money. What should Tom propose? Let me put scare quotes around the word should uh, when I pronounce it. What should he, pro what's the right answer here? The economist wants to know if you're self-interested and you're in Tom's shoes. Okay, 
they say, let's play it out and analyze it as a game. So instead of making a payoff matrix, what we do here is we make a game tree. A game tree is an, another way of summarizing the incentives in a game that takes into account explicitly the timing of the moves when those matter. In the prisoner's dilemma, the timing of the moves doesn't matter in principle because each party has a dominant strategy. You would want to do that whether you move first or you move second or simultaneous, it wouldn't matter. So Tom propo proposes x for himself, 100 minus x for Michael. Then it's Michael's turn. If he accepts, he gets uh, the 100 minus x that Tom offered, uh, and, and Tom gets to keep the x. If he says no, he gets 0. And here's the way economists urge you to think about these games. Tom, who's making the proposal, should walk around to the back of the game tree and pretend he's Michael and look at the outcomes Michael is going to see at the next stage, uh, stage in this game. And he's going to say to himself, if I'm Michael, if I accept, what do I get? I get 100 minus x. If I refuse, I get 0. X being a number no smaller than 1, what, what should I do? Well, think about it a little further. If you're Tom, uh, what should you propose if, if you're selfish? Suppose he proposes 99 for himself and 1 for Michael. That's his offer. Michael looks at the two options, and he sees that if he accepts, he gets a dollar. If he refuses, he gets zero. What's he going to do? He's going to accept under the assumptions of this problem, because each cares only about the monetary payoff when he walks out of the room. If he's confronted with this offer, that's why this is called the ultimatum game, he's got to take it or leave it offer. Either take the one or get zero. And because he's assumed to be narrowly self-interest, he doesn't care about norms of fair play or any, anything else uh, beyond just how much money do I get, he says, all right, uh, that, that wasn't a nice thing you did to me, Tom, but a dollar is better than nothing, so I accept. How many of you think that if Tom offered you a dollar and proposed to keep 99 for himself, that you would accept? There's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just empirically, how many of you think you would accept that offer? How many of you think you might consider at least saying no? I think I would say no. I'm, I, I, I'm actually quite certain I would say no. Why would anyone say no? Somebody might say, plausibly, it was worth it to spend a dollar to see the look on Tom's face. <laughs> When he realized, oh, if I'd said 50-50, I'd be walking out of here with 50 bucks. Now I'm getting zero. Well, at least uh, Michael didn't get anything either. Michael's not feeling too bad about that because he's got a good story to tell. Uh, he, he got a big burst of utils by seeing <laughs> how, you, how you reacted to his unexpected refusal of his offer. So what we know from the actual experiments that have been done here, we know one thing for sure, that if you give 99 for me, one for you, that almost always gets turned down. This has been done in many countries. Sometimes the sums at stake are several months' salary. Uh, in a poor enough country, the NSF budget will allow you to offer sums that really matter to people, not just the token amounts that we can afford to pay in the labs here. If you offer the other party 25% of the, of the total to be divided, you see half the people accept that, half the people say no. If you offer 50%, which people do more often than not when they're given a chance here, people almost never refuse an offer like that. Why would you? We know that if the computer tells you what you have to offer, if Tom uh, and Michael both know that he's not, Tom's not free to, to 
specify the offer himself, but has to offer whatever the computer random num numberator spits out. And he says, 99 for me, one for you. People accept that offer. It seems to be that they're really upset that Tom would propose such a one-sided offer rather than uh, be a little bit more generous with this windfall that the experimenter has bestowed upon him. If, if Tom says 99 for me, one for you, that's a dick move. That's a very, that's, that's, that's not something that you want to be associated with. The, the business schools in the, in the U.S. have negotiations courses where they teach that if you're in this situation, the right move is 99 for me, one for you. That's not the right move when you go out in the world. Uh, and not just because your reputation will follow you for having done such things. That will compound the, the injury you suffer if that's the kind of way you negotiate in situations like this. If you're the kind of person who would do that, people get a sense that you're the kind of person who would do that. What kind of person would do that? You probably, maybe have, I hope you don't, uh, haven't made yet the acquaintance of a, a classmate that you think would do that. Uh, is there one among you who would do that? Uh, some careers attract more than, of, of those people than others. Uh, look around. But, but those aren't the people you want on your team. Uh, and every time somebody makes a promotion decision about you, that person is going to have an opinion about whether you're the kind of person who would say, 99 for me, one for you. So you don't want to be that kind of person. You're not going to be a good deal maker if that's the kind of person you are. Uh, people don't want to deal with people like that. That's the subject we're going to focus on exclusively on Monday. How do you get a broader mix of motives into this uh, narrow rational choice model without giving up the whole ball game and saying people do whatever they want to do? That's not a very good predictive model for, for uh, charting human behavior. People behave in systematic ways. How, how, do you, how do you make models of what they'll really do if this model of what they'll do is wrong? It's not completely wrong, mind you. Why might somebody say, uh, I refuse in response to, to an offer, 99 for me, one for you? I, I, I don't think that's fair, and I care about fairness, you might say. OK, you care about fairness. Let's change the stakes of the experiment. Uh, now it's $100 million. And I'm Tom. I say, uh, Michael, here's the deal. A million for you, 990, or 99 million for me. 100 million is the total. 99 million for me, a million for you. Take it or leave it. What do you say? <laughs> I thought you cared about fairness. You do care about fairness. You care about fairness, but you care about other things too. Life's imperfect. It's a set of trade-offs that you confront. You want to predict what people are going to do? You have to be mindful of what the actual trade-offs are that they face. So just to relax this uh, uh, silly homo economicus assumption, uh, is not to embrace the extreme opposite of that. So, no, people don't care about money at all. No, people do care about money. You know that. It's a balancing act uh, in every domain. You've got, to, you've got to be sensitive to what people's concerns are if you're going to predict what they're going to do. Here's a related problem. Should the big business owner open a, di a distant branch outlet? They've got a thriving business locally. Uh, the, the city 300 miles away has the exact same demographics. You know the business would be a huge success there if you opened it and it were managed honestly. If it were, you could pay the manager $1,000 uh, salary, and you would clear an economic profit of $1,000 from doing it. 
a win-win because the manager's alternative is to work at a, a, an ordinary job where you get paid only $500. But what if the manager manages dishonestly? Then all bets are off. You can't monitor the manager uh, completely. You can put cameras on the wall and do audits and all that, but there still would be opportunities where the manager would be enough out of your surveillance that he could cheat you. And if he did cheat you, let's make some assumptions. He would do better than if he didn't cheat you. The problem's not interesting if that's not true. So he'd get 15 if he cheated you. He'd get only 1,000 if he were honest. And you would lose $500 if he cheated you. The amounts don't add up to anything. This, this is just the, the payoffs from these outcomes. So uh, you know that. He knows that. Are you going to open, open this branch if you think managers are like economists model people as being, you're going to not want to open that branch. Let's see how it would look from a game theory perspective. We'll construct the game tree for this game. The manager uh, candidate comes and says, if you hire me, I'll be honest. Of course he's going to say that. What, who would say, if you hire me, I'm going to steal money from you? Uh, <laughs> Nobody's going to say that. So the, the statement that if you hire me, I'll be on it doesn't have a lot of weight uh, just by itself. You would need some other reason to, to believe that the manager was going to be honest. And maybe you think of yourself as a realist. You know that people deep down aren't honest. So you're skeptical. But anyway, you think about it. You have a choice. Open the outlet or not. If you don't open the outlet, the game's over. Basically, you get zero. The manager gets 500, the salary he would get in the other job. If you open the outlet, then we put you to node C in the game tree where the manager has to decide what to do next. And he can manage honestly, in which case he'll get 1,000 payoff for himself and he'll get uh, generate a payoff of 1,000 for you. Or he can manage dishonestly and get 1,500 and a minus 500 payoff for you. And the way the owner thinks about this, if he's a game theorist, is to stand back here and say, what's Michael going to do if he sees those outcomes? And he, if he thinks Michael is self-interested, or the manager is self-interested, he's going to say he's comparing 1,500 with 1,000, and he likes that better, so that's what he's going to do. And if he does that, I lose 500, so I'm not going there. I won't, don't want to lose 500 since I have the option of not losing anything. Both parties lose in this situation. There's a better outcome if they could figure out how to get there. What if the manager could make a binding commitment to manage honestly? Would he want to do that? He would. Why? Because unless, unless he could make a credible binding commitment to manage honestly, he knows that the owner won't even open this outlet. He'll, he'll be stuck working for 500. Would the owner? Be willing to open it if the manager could make a binding commitment? Sure. The owner's going to get 1,000 rather than zero. So if they could figure out a way to solve this, I'm going to call it a commitment problem, then they're home free. They, they, can, they can each get a gain that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. But here, too, it's a failure of the invisible hand model. The invisible hand model says, let people do what's in their interest to do, give them the freedom uh, to do that, and you'll get the best possible outcomes. Well, you don't get a good outcome if people obey the standard assumptions of the invisible hand model, namely that they're greedy and will act in their own interest in the narrow sense of the term. Uh, not everybody believes that's how people are, but that's the standard model. Okay. So... Are there ways to solve problems like this? Suppose you were in the situation of the owner of this business. Do you think you could find somebody who you would feel confident would manage the outlet? Here's a thought experiment. I'll return to this one on Monday because it's central to the argument that I'm going to present to you then. You've gone to a crowded concert. You've lost an envelope with $10,000 in cash in it. You were all set to buy a card a car the next day, uh, the owner wanted cash, you took cash out of the bank, the envelope has your cash in it and your name and address on it, you get home from the concert, 
the envelope's no longer in your coat pocket. Oh, that sound I heard must have been the envelope falling out of my coat pocket onto the floor uh, as I got up from my seat. Somebody found it. You don't know who found it. Can you think of it, here's the question, can you think of anybody not related to you by blood or marriage who you feel certain would return your money if she found it? There'd be no pe penalty to the person who, if, if she kept it. You wouldn't know she'd found it. Uh, it's a concert where there were 20,000 people. You had no idea this person found your money. Well, most people on reflection say, yeah, I know, I know somebody I'd be, feel pretty, I know several people I'd be willing to bet would return my money. And, and there's some evidence that the intuitions they have about other people like that are pretty informative. If you don't know somebody you think would return your money, I feel bad for you. <laughs> Get out more. Form, form more uh, lasting bonds with your social partners. Uh, uh, the normal human condition is that you ought to have people that you would trust to do something like that. If, but if you do have people like that, that means that it's possible for you even though you can't see whether they cheated you, it's possible for you to predict accurately whether they'll cheat you if they have a chance to do it without being detected. So if you could do a prediction like that, you'd be able to solve this problem. You could solve the commitment problem that is on the table here. That's what we're going to talk about on Monday. Let's go back to this question uh, that I asked you to think about. You've got more ammunition to think about it now than you had at the beginning of the hour, clearly. It's a game. Uh, there, the, the, it's a game where we summarize the relevant information in a game tree, not with a payoff matrix, because the timing of the moves matters in this game. The first mover is the waiter. He has to decide whether to give good service or bad service. Bad service is harder. Uh, if good service were easier to give, it'd be an easy call. You would just give good service. Uh, but good service is harder to give. Bad service is easier to give. If I said that wrong, bad service is the easy uh, service to provide. If he gives that service, he won't get a tip. He'll get 80. If he gives good service and the diner gives him a tip, he'll get 100. So this, this is a better outcome from the waiter to go here than to go here. But the waiter also is a game theorist, and he stands here, and he looks at the game tree from this side, and he says, what's the diner going to do if I go here? And the di he says, the diner's going to look at his payoff here and see 100, and he'll look at his payoff here and see 200. And he said, if I give good service, I'm going to end up here. I get 20 here. I could get 80 here. I'm going here. That's the standard prediction of the game theory model. That's a bad outcome both for di the diner and for the waiter. Why? Because they would both do better if they could somehow get here. But it's not in the interest, in the narrow material sense, for the diner to go there if he's given a chance to go there. Now we're going to suppose that he has some practical way of committing himself to go there if he gets good service. So maybe Arthur Anderson is offering a service, a commitment service. You sign a contract with Arthur Anderson. They send a guy. He stands next to the table. If you get good service and don't leave a tip, they deduct $1,000 from your account. So if you get good service, uh, and you've signed that contract, you know, if you're the waiter, that's going to be in his interest to give me a tip under those circumstances. So I'm going to, if I'm the waiter, feel confident going here because if I get good, if I give him good service, it's going to be in his interest to give me a tip and then we each get 100 as our payoff. And that's better than what's going to happen if I don't go there. I'll get only 80. The diner does better, the waiter does better. How much better does the diner do in that situation if he could make that binding commitment to leave a tip if he got good service, if he could make that commitment visible to the waiter, the waiter knows he's bound to do it, uh, if he could make that commitment for free, how much better off would the diner be? 
he would be getting a payoff of 100. The fallback is to get a payoff of 30. So the question asks you, what's the, what's the maximum he'd be willing to pay for the right to make a visible commitment to leave a tip if he got good service? And the answer is either 30, 100, 170, 200, or none of the above. The answer is none of the above because the amount he'd be willing to pay is up to $70 to make a binding commitment. The commitment is valuable to him. How valuable? $70. Let me guess most of you wouldn't have gotten that right if you had to do it at the, or a fifth of you would have gotten that right. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the hour. Uh, would more of you gotten it right at the end of the hour? I, I, I'd, be, I'd be crushed if the answer to that question wasn't yes, but how many of you would have gotten it right? Uh, it's not a hard question, but if, you, if you're not attentive to the, the logic of the game dynamics, you're not going to get it right. These are, these are points you could get. Get them. Don't leave them on the table. You don't, want to, you don't want to pass up easy points that you could get but by just not being attentive to this. Okay. I'll see you all on Monday.